morning, everyone. Good to have you with us. Welcome to the Christianity and Natural Sciences session in which we're going to talk about the historical Adam and Eve and evangelical conversation. The four presenters are going to, um, uh, they're going to present the summaries of their essays in a book that will be published this spring by Broadman and Holdman, um, Perspectives on the Historical Adam and Eve and Evangelical Conversation. Uh, our four essayists are Kenton Sparks, William Lane Craig, Andrew Loke, and Marcus Ross. Um, and then after we hear the, from the four presenters, we're going to have three respondents, and there's only four chairs up here. So they, the, these good men have been uh, kind enough to sit in the front. They'll come up uh, at that time and give their various responses. We're going to hear from uh, Hans Maduemi, Fuzz Rana, and Joshua Swaminas. And after that, we will open the floor for uh, questions at that time. Um, in our conversations, Kenton Sparks uh, with the non-historical Adam and Eve view and Marcus Ross with the recent Adam and Eve view, I think we could safely say represent uh, the two ends of the spectrum of this conversation on the historicity of Adam and Eve. Uh, and in between, probably, I think we could safely say are the positions of Andrew and William Lane Craig. Um, each of the presenters were asked to address at some point three questions. How does your position interpret the biblical witness concerning the historicity of Adam and Eve? Uh, second, how does your position integrate with the current scientific consensus concerning hominids? And three, how does your position impact the message and ministry of the church? Uh, all four have done uh, a commendable job. This outline that is being distributed summarizes my case for the mytho-historical view of Adam and Eve. According to this view, Genesis 1 to 11 describes real people and events, but in the figurative and metaphorical language characteristic of myth, and therefore should not be interpreted with a wooden literality. Points 1 to 10 summarize my justification for analyzing the literary genre of Genesis 1 to 11 as mytho-history, and points 11 to 18 summarize my attempt to most plausibly locate the existence of a founding pair of all mankind according to the scientific evidence from paleoanthropology. Now, I'm not going to rehearse these points today. I've defended them at length in my book, In Quest of the Historical Adam, 2021. Rather, today, I want to share with you some rather astonishing new evidence that has emerged since the book's publication and that provides dramatic scientific confirmation of my hypothesis. Indeed, this new evidence has emerged even more recently than our contributions to this Four Views book. When I say that it provides scientific confirmation of my hypothesis, I do not mean that it proves my hypothesis to be true, but that my hypothesis is rendered even more probable by this new evidence than it was without it. Indeed, I think that this evidence provides significant scientific confirmation of my hypothesis so that my hypothesis is significantly more probable given this evidence. In points 12 and 13 of the handout, I mention archaeological signatures of modern cognitive behavior which push human origins back in time prior to the origin of our species, Homo sapiens. Such signatures continue to accumulate. For example, in August, a team of archaeologists announced the discovery at Colombo Falls, Zambia of, and I quote, the earliest evidence for the structural use of wood in the archaeological record. Two interlocking logs joined transversely by an intentionally cut notch 
which the excavators compare to toy Lincoln logs, were discovered. The wooden construction was dated by luminescence methods to at least 476,000 years ago, making this the earliest human construction of any sort ever found. Observing that, quote, life in a periodically wet floodplain would be enhanced by constructing a raised platform, walkway, or foundation for dwellings, the archaeologists comment, would, from tree trunks, enable humans to construct large objects such as platform foundations that necessitated tools for felling and hewing trees. The structure antedates the rise of Homo sapiens and therefore is highly unlikely to have been due to our species. But according to one of the archaeologists, Jeffrey Duller of Aberystwyth University, and I quote, the complexity of the structure suggests the people who made it were cognitively sophisticated and were able to make and execute a complex plan, something that likely required the use of language, end quote. This discovery is part of an ongoing pattern of archaeological signatures of modern cognitive behavior ever deeper in the primordial past, pushing human origins back hundreds of thousands of years. Even more astonishing and significant is a second new finding. In point 16 of the outline, I note that the existence of a single couple who are the progenitors of the entire human race cannot be ruled out on the basis of population genetics if they lived earlier than 500,000 years ago. Thus, my hypothesis that Adam and Eve belonged to the human species Homo heidelbergensis is compatible with the evidence of population genetics, as well as with the paleontological and archaeological evidence. This claim of my book, though a striking reversal of the conventional wisdom among Christian thinkers, is a negative one. The evidence of population genetics does not rule out the existence of a founding pair so long as they lived prior to 500,000 years ago. But less than two months ago, in September, a team of population geneticists using a new method of calculating population size history published in the journal Science the results of their study showing that the human population actually did go through what they call a severe population bottleneck of, on average, less than 1,300 breeding individuals over a window of time about 100,000 years, between 900 and 800,000 years ago. They state, and I quote, we used FitCole, their new methodology, to analyze a large number of present-day human genomic sequences from 10 African and 40 non-African populations. Results showed that our ancestors experienced a severe population bottleneck between about 930 and 813,000 years before present. The average number of breeding individuals was only about 1,280 during the bottleneck period. Thus, we now have evidence that such a severe population bottleneck not only could have taken place prior to 500,000 years ago, but that it actually did take place. Since the number 1,280 is not a minimum population size, but an average over a window of 100,000 years, 
the results are consistent with my hypothesis that during that period, the human population, as one regresses into the past, shrank down to just two individuals who were the founding pair of the human race. Most intriguing of all, for my hypothesis, the scientists report that associated with this ancient severe bottleneck was, and I quote, a speciation event leading to the emergence of the last common ancestor shared by Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans, whose divergence has been dated to around 765 to 550,000 years before present, end quote. They note that although the taxonomic statuses of human fossil remains from this period are still not clear, and I quote, they have features resembling those of later fossils attributed to Homo heidelbergensis. These recent findings of population genetics represent scientific confirmation of my hypothesis beyond my wildest dreams. I thought that at best the evidence of population genetics would not rule out the hypothesis of a founding pair belonging to Homo heidelbergensis, but it never occurred to me that the scientific evidence from population genetics would provide positive confirmation for my hypothesis. Now again, Scientific confirmation does not amount to proof. Nevertheless, if these new results do hold up, then my model of the historical atom is not merely hermeneutically superior, but also scientifically superior to any of its rivals.